listening to Harris Smith Radio. I'm your host, Wayne McPhail. In this episode, you'll hear the remarkable story of the Farmerettes, a brigade of young Ontario women who saved the crops of southern Ontario during World War II. You may not have heard of the Farmerettes. I know I hadn't until I prepared for this interview, but it's a story you won't forget. Next up, our intergenerational gardening gurus Mark and Ben Cullen give us some tips on why waiting for May 24th to plant is a mugs game. So, two stories about getting back into the good earth. By the way, if you want to read Harris Smith magazine instead of listen to it, you can subscribe to the print version online at harrismithmag.com. And you can find Harris Smith magazine on selected newsstands across Canada. But for now, settle in for the next half hour of Harris Smith Radio. In 1939, the stain of the Second World War spread across the Atlantic to Canada, pulling Canadian men and women overseas to fight. In southern Ontario, that meant fertile farmlands and orchards would soon be swollen and laden with fruit and vegetables that would rot while able farmhands were fighting Germany. Fortunately, that summer and until 1952, over 20,000 high school girls from Ontario and Quebec enlisted in a homegrown brigade called the Farmerettes. Lured with a promise of sunshine, adventure, and exclusion from final exams, they left their homes and took trains, boats, and bicycles to become newly minted farmers in the fields of gold and green of Ontario. They stayed in converted sheds and barns, became close friends, smoked corn cob pipes, fell in love, and even fell in with good-natured motorcycle gangs. And they saved the crops and fed the troops. Bonnie Sitter and Shirley Ann English have documented the story of the Farmerettes in a wonderful book called Onion Skins and Peach Fuzz, Memories of Ontario Farmerettes. The book contains letters the Farmerettes sent home to anxious parents and is packed with evocative black and white photographs. And it was a photograph that Bonnie Sitter found in her late husband's photo album that started her on the path to harvest the Farmerette tales. I spoke with Bonnie via Zoom about the photo that started it all. Here's our conversation. Bonnie, thanks so much for joining us. I got to tell you, I just loved the book. Like, it's a fantastic glimpse at a group of women during World War II that I think a lot of people don't know about. So how did you come to know about it? How did you discover the Farmerettes? Well, on a winter's day, I decided it was time to go through my husband's photo album and and sort out pictures for my sons. And I came across a little picture, a little black and white picture with three girls sitting on the running board of a car. And they had straw hats and, and there was a hole in the hands of the girl in the middle. And I thought, don't recognize any of these people. You know, I don't think they're my husband's cousins. So I turned the picture over and on the back. It was written Farmerettes about 1946. And I thought, well, I don't know anything about Farmerettes. And then, of course, then I thought, well, I should have asked Conrad. And of course, Conrad's dead. I can't ask him. And I thought, OK, his sister-in-law would have given this picture to him when the farm uh, house was you know, dismantled. And uh, I thought, well, I'm going to learn about Farmerettes. So I started doing research and I discovered that there wasn't a, a lot of history on the Internet about the Farmerettes that I could uh, come across quickly, at least. Um, there was a novel written for teenagers, but you know, I'm not much into novels. I'm looking for the real thing. So I just continued to do research and found enough material. A girlfriend said to me, well, would you like to interview a real farmerette? And I said, I sure would. She said, my mother was a farmerette. She grew up in Toronto and uh, she worked in the Niagara uh, Fruit Belt in 1946. And she said, uh, she's now living in Godrich and I'll introduce you. So I got introduced and discovered that this woman had about 17 letters that had been she had written home to her parents and the parents saved those letters and gave them back to her. So I had a a really good handle on what day to day life was like for these girls, where they lived, the jobs they did, what they were paid that, you know, all the things that were happening um, during that summer of 1946. And how did you come to uh, meet up with Shirley Ann English, who's the co-author of the book? 
Well, the article that I uh, submitted to the magazine called The Rural Voice, there was a lady in London, Ontario, who had a subscription to it. She read the story, passed it to another friend who read the story, and then thought, I think my friend Shirley Ann said she was a farmerette. I'll, say, I'll pass it on to her. So through all those hands, Shirley Ann received it, read it, and um, got quite emotional about it because... Uh, when she saw that my name, my family name was Sitter, she said, that's got to be a connection to the Thedford Sitters where she had worked in 1952. So she wrote a letter to the editor saying how she was touched by the article and it had been the best summer of her life and uh, that she had dated George Sitter all that summer. And of course, George is the man that became my brother-in-law. I discovered that in 1995, she wanted to write a story, maybe for Chatelaine or, you know, a women's magazine, telling about this great summer that she had, because even now she's 83, it's still the best summer of her life. So she, she put an ad in papers that uh, said, if you're a farmerette, get in touch with me, I'd like to write a story. So newspapers across Ontario carried this little write-up, and nearly 300 letters came into Shirley Ann, and I said, do you still have them? And she said, I think so. And I said, well, dig them out. We are going to write a book. And so I got the letters and started reading and sorting and, you know, um, started trying to find ladies that, you know, might still be alive. Everyone that I found when I said the word farmerettes, there was just an absolute joy in their voice. And they were just wanting to talk about the summer or summers, because some of them went more than once, about their experience as a farmerette. The camaraderie was just amazing. Where did the girls come from? Was it just Ontario that they came from? Or no, there were some from Quebec, right? There were girls from Quebec uh, that did join in. And in fact, some girls actually rode their bicycles from Quebec down into the uh, Niagara Fruit Belt to work, if you can imagine. And I have pictures of those girls doing that. A lot of girls came from northern Ontario, places like South Porcupine and New Liskert and Anglehart and Geraldton, even Fort William. Their way was paid by the government. The girls had to sign up to, to work at least 13 weeks. Um, if they did work the 13 weeks, their way home was paid as well. The, the, big, the big hooks in attracting these girls was it was called camp. It was called farmer at camp. And most girls were never going to get the chance to go to camp. And the other hook was that if you were doing well in school, you could get out of writing your final exams, be excused early to get down to the farms and start working in April. And where were those farms? Was it mostly southern Ontario or, or where? It was it was the Niagara Peninsula and it was southwestern Ontario Lambton County, Essex County, wherever there was market gardening and, and orchards. That's mostly uh, where it was. And right around where Toronto Airport is now, that was, that was all market gardening in there. Girls rode their bicycles out on Monday morning, stayed in a little trailer for the week, and rode their bicycles home on Friday night. So how much did they get paid? It, you know, for, Judging from the book, it wasn't very much, but it's hard to get a sense of, was it a, a lot of money for them back then, or was it just barely making ends meet? Well, it was, it was 25 cents an hour, but the research that I did showed that that's what farm labor was paid. The girls knew that if, you know, they didn't work enough hours or whatever, they, they you know, they were going to come up short because they, they generally paid about four fifty a week for their room and board. And that was seven days a week that they were being fed. It wasn't just five days a week. Ration coupons were handed in when they arrived at camp. The cook did the juggling to make sure that there was food. No, and they they picked a wide variety of things, right? They were picking peaches and peppermint and tomatoes and onions, asparagus, parsnips, all right across the board, right? And the big fruit, you know, was the peaches and, and the cherries in Niagara. They were really, really a, a big item. But they, I mean, they picked gooseberries, they picked raspberries, strawberries, any fruit at all uh, or any vegetables. They staked the rows of tomatoes. I mean, 250 plants in a, in a row to be staked and suckered. And I think they got like, you know, 25 or 50 cents a row to do that. 250 plants. Yeah. You know, it was backbreaking work. I mean, cutting the asparagus was, was really a tough job. And of course, it grew overnight and it was ready to be picked again the next morning. 
That's amazing. And and one of the things that I was really surprised at is, and I didn't realize this because I've never picked peaches, like again and again in the letters, the the young women hated picking peaches because of the fuzz, right? Right. The peaches at that time were much fuzzier than they are now. Our peaches now are more like a nectarine skin than they are a peach. But the rashes were terrible. Some girls, um, you know, had, had to go home and uh, take other war work. One girl talked about they were her Waterloo. She, she got so bad, the doctor sent her home, and then she ended up working in the Campbell Soup Factory on the midnight shift. The, they dealt with the peach itch. Uh, they put cornstarch on their arms and, and uh, around their neck. So tell me what uh, the day in the life of a farmerette would have been like from, from sunrise to sunset. Just sort of give me a quick sort of elevator pitch of what that day was like. Okay, so uh, the farmers would typically show up, you know, 730 or so in the morning, either with a flatbed uh, wagon pulled behind a tractor or um, a truck um, that the girls would just pile in anywhere and everywhere. Some of the girls would ride on the fender and, and wrap their legs around the headlights Said that was the best place to work or to ride to work. But they would have they would be awakened and they would have their breakfast. It would all be set out for them. Generally, they made their lunches the night before. The food was set out, the bread, and uh, they made their lunches, packed them for the morning. Some girls talked about doing their lunches uh, the same morning before they left. Anyway, lunches in hand, straw hats on, bandanas around their hair, whatever, loaded uh, into trucks and wagons and off to the farm to do the labor. Lunchtime, unpack the lunches, try to find some shade and uh, have their break. They would generally water uh, to drink. Uh, occasionally, farm ladies would you know, treat them to lemonade. They would work uh, again. The next shift would be until five or six in the evening. They would be dog tired and ride back to the farm, rush into the shower, try to get cleaned up, have their supper. And although they thought they were dead tired, they re got renewed energy, and if there was any entertainment nearby, like in Thedford, there was a roller rink very close, they would scoot across the field to the roller rink and keep watching the clock because 9.30 was curfew, get back to the camp in time to be into bed and lights out at 10 o'clock. And sometimes they didn't come back. They would, you know, sort of skip curfew and hop a fence and stuff, right? That's right. <laughs> a lot of the women talk about hitchhiking, which really surprised me because I'm thinking about what it would be like now. But they hitchhiked to Toronto, to Detroit, to Buffalo. So let's talk a little bit about that kind of that that sense of safety around that and the sort of lack of danger that they felt compared to, to now. The, the mothers warned their daughters before they left, essentially, no hitchhiking. But when they got there, if they wanted to go anyplace, that was, that was the, the means of transportation. They were told they were never, ever to hitchhike alone, that they should go in groups of three. And, and that's what they did. And, and they did travel all over the countryside. For example, when there wasn't work for a two-week period and, and the girls had to find something else to do, some girls that live nearby would say, well, come come home with me. And the way they would go, so they would hitchhike and a car stop, all of them, you know, three or four of them pile into the back seat, no seat belts, no problem. They didn't, they didn't run into problems by doing this. It seemed to work out well. It certainly wouldn't work today, but it, it did work then. There was lots of servicemen uh, hitchhiking as well. And one girl commented that if there was a serviceman hitchhiking, they would, you know, they would get up close to him so that when he got a ride, they could pile into the car as well. And it really seems like there was a lot of camaraderie in the, the camps. And one of the things that really struck me, and I think there's a photograph of it in the book, uh, there's one group of, of women, the Thetford girls, who were smoking corn cob pipes, right? Is that actually, that did they, did they actually do that? Oh, yes, they did. Lots of girls tried smoking. And um, some of them in their letters said, you know, I, you know, I wish I hadn't tried smoking or I tried it once. That was enough. I didn't do it again. But they, but they did try it for sure. And the girls in Thedford said, you know, we invaded the pool hall and, you know, smoked our pipes and, and whatever. They were emboldened by, you know, being in a group and, and encouraging each other, you know, to uh, to misbehave. 
So there were some romances that took place in the uh, camps. There were uh, soldiers. There were the sons of farmers that the girls would have met. Uh, there's one that really stood out for me, though, is the, the romance between Joe Gibson and Isabel Chowden. Can you tell me the story of that? Uh, Joe and Isabel met just a month, I guess, before Isabel was assigned to Vineland Camp. And she had agreed to go to Vineland as a farmerette because her girlfriend, Joan, had been there this summer before and had fallen in love with one of the local boys. So off they went to Vineland. And, and a few days later, Isabel was feeling very, very homesick. So she called Joe and said, please come down and have a visit. So Joe got on his motorcycle, a Harley Davidson he paid $350 for it, his first transportation as a young farm boy, and he headed for Vineland. He stayed longer than he should have, and so the cook agreed to let him sleep in the cookhouse that night. Meanwhile, the girls at Vineland were all jealous that Isabel had a boyfriend with a motorcycle and said, have you got friends with motorcycles, Joe? And he said, I sure do. So the group of friends came down with him the next time and they all went to places like, you know, Crystal Beach and Niagara Falls and uh, really had a lovely day. The romance continued, of course, and, and Joe had a picture of Isabel that he carried in his Harley Davidson cap in the little spot up on the inside of the, the top of the cap where he would normally carry his license. He had his picture of Isabel. And you know, more than 60 years later, the the picture is still in the Harley Davidson cap that Joe has. The cap is falling apart, but the picture is still there in a safe place. And they they married and, um, and lived in this area. And I found out just by chance through another friend, she said, if you're still looking for farmerettes, I have a girlfriend. And that was Isabel. I had a lady call from Dundas and she said, I'm the one that married the man that, I'm, that married the farmer on page 37 or whatever. That was, it, it did happen. And um, a girl that came down from South Porcupine, her father was worried about her. So he phoned relatives in Hamilton and said, you know, do you know anybody that has a car that can go over to Camp Winona and find Elvisia and see if she's okay? So they said, yes. They found a, another family with a car. Their son drove the young man over to Winona. And of course, the driver of the car fell in love with Elvisia that summer. And they married and they were married for 60 some years. So there were love stories for sure. Yeah. And I, I really like the Joe and Isabel story. And you've got a wonderful picture of uh, Isabel in the hat in the book, which is just a great shot of her in, in, in hollyhocks. And I love the fact that Joe and his friends were riding army surplus Harleys and they were <laughs> called the, the clattering piston. So it's a sort of a, a, a friendly motorcycle gang, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So... What difference did the, the young women make? What difference did the farmerettes and the other brigades make? Did they actually save crops? Did they actually make a difference to the war effort? Oh, they absolutely made a difference to the war effort. The harvest would have been lost if these girls hadn't stepped up and, uh, and replaced the men that had, had left to do war service. But the, these girls did make a difference. In the 11 years, it was probably a figure like 20,000 young girls stepped up and, and took their place and, and did an amazing job. And these were high school girls, right? Like it, it's, I had to remind myself when I was reading about their stories and stuff that these were just kids in grade 11 and 12 that were just, you know, just young, young, young girls. I mean, most of them had never been on a farm. They had no idea what it was all about. The program ran for 11 years, so the, the war didn't last that long. So it extended past the end of the war. Why was that? Well, of course, the men didn't come home the day the war was over. It was a long process getting the men back. And when they, were, when they came back, they were offered opportunities to you know, go to university. Uh, they didn't all want to go back to the farms to work. The, the labor force was still needed. Finally, in 1952, I mean, mechanization had started to take over. Uh, the girls weren't needed to the same extent. And the other thing that happened in 1952 was that the, the families that had immigrated from Holland and were working on farms, essentially the, the children and the adults in those families were doing the work that the farm rats had been doing. What was the image or the story that most stood out for you, that most touched you? Well, the, the story of the girls arriving at camp and being told, you know, you'll be up at a certain time tomorrow morning. You need to get your lunches made so that when the farmers come to pick you up, you'll be ready. 
And the makings for the lunch were loaves of bread and cans of pork and beans. And they, they were all pretty unhappy. They thought, you know, what have we gotten into for this summer? So they all agreed that they would write a letter home and say, you know, they're having, you know everything's great here and everything's fine. Everything's going to be great. So uh, Bernice states in her story that they, after one miserable first day, they had a summer of just absolutely wonderful camaraderie. And when, when the last day came and her girlfriend, Winnie, um, was going home, Winnie made her lunch, even though it wasn't her turn to make lunches. She made her a very special lunch and she went off to the orchard. Winnie's parents came and picked her up. And Winnie said, I got to go see Bernice one more time. So they drove to the orchard. Winnie found Bernice in the tree and stood there and sobbed and sobbed and didn't want to go home. And um, Bernice said, you know, there was my friend, big, tough Winnie, just, you know, sobbing away because we'd had such a good summer and she didn't want to go. What did you learn from interviewing all these women? I think it was the the, the cooperation, uh, the camaraderie was a really big thing that they knew if they worked together and encouraged each other in the fields, in the orchards, when they when they were working, they 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 you know, of course talked about boyfriends, talked about movies, talked about the news, talked about what their dreams were. It really struck me that the the strong friendships. For the, for the summers were, were amazing. And yet when they made up songs about their camp, um, they, they, they sang and they giggled and they looked at the long rows and they just kept marching on. That was Bonnie Sitter, who is still gathering stories about the remarkable farmerettes today. You may think in the earliest days of spring that you've got plenty of time before you have to turn your hand to gardening, but you would be wrong. Yes, May 24th may seem a long way off, but there is plenty you can do now and you'll score early garden bounty in the process. Here to give us the details are those early birds, Mark and Ben Cullen. Hey guys, thanks for joining us. I I wanted to start this off by thinking about, as Mark, you've called it the May 2-4 weekend, the May 24th weekend, people think that's when, okay, now we got to get serious about gardening. Like now we've got to go. Is it the case that you you have to wait till May? And also, is it the case given that the idea of the May 24th weekend was around before climate change, has that shifted and is that a complete imaginary weekend now? Well, no, it's not an imaginary weekend, but uh, and it's not just ch- climate change either, Wayne. It's it's generational change. So, you know, the new generation has got different ideas about when they're going to get out in the garden and they're going to do things. And I don't want to suggest to listeners that waiting until the May 2-4 weekend is like shutting the barn door after the horse is gone. But I want to suggest that gardening in April is a different barn. It's a different <laughs> verse. And so, so let's talk, let's talk about the possibilities of gardening when we know there's still going to be some frost. We could miss a lot of opportunities if we don't get out there soon. So Ben, what kind of stuff should we be thinking about planting now then? I always, I mean, when it's still cool, it doesn't hurt to get the greens going because you're going to have that crisp lettuce off uh, pretty quickly and you can always use the cold frames to get going. It's good to get a cold frame up to warm up the soil before you plant into it. So let the let the cold frame over that soil mass track some heat before you try and do anything under there. But you can't go wrong starting, say, carrots or greens too early, really, at this stage. And cold frames could be things like old windows and stuff, right? They don't need to be complicated things, right? That's exactly what they are, right? Ben, you and I both have old windows that we built frames around. We've got those. or I mean, another format entirely is the cold tunnel, which is hoops over the ground with some poly uh, material on top. It looks completely different. It serves exactly the same function. Right. Yeah. So, and people can uh, set up a grow op downstairs. I mean, that's what we've got. We've got a grow op going very shortly in the basement. So what if people haven't done that, what should they be thinking about now doing that? 
Well, when you're starting starting seeds, heat is really more important than light, right? Until it germinates, it's not photosynthesizing. So if you've got some heat maps, uh, you could put that anywhere in the house. Uh, or you could use, say, the top of a refrigerator where there's going to be some ambient warmth. That's a great place to get seeds going. And then once you start to see that little bit of green where it starts to photosynthesize, you're either going to need some artificial light on top of that or a really bright window. Uh, so those are sort of the two considerations at this stage. And Mark, what what should people be growing now? Like what would be smart to grow? Well, it's funny, Ben mentioned greens, and that's absolutely true. All of the greens, the mescaline mix, the, the leaf lettuce, um, but <clears throat> by extension, speaking of greens, broccoli, kale, Swiss chard, peas, carrots, beets, all those things can be started in the garden by direct sowing now. Some of those things, the, the, leafy, the leafy plants, uh, like the broccoli, for instance, cauliflower, all the mentioned, all, all, all of the cold, cold crops, um, not cold crops, but coal crops. Sometimes we, we just simply call them the gassy vegetables. <laughs> you know, get those started by seed right now and then do the transplants later in the month or early in May, if you like. Um, and the others that I mentioned, and I didn't mention onions, for instance, uh, beets, carrots, peas, I mentioned all those, I mentioned them again, put them all to buy seed directly in the soil, get, get, get going with that now. So, uh, so Ben, what are, what would be the stupid things to work on now and plant? Like what's, what's destined for disaster? What's destined for disaster? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I probably wouldn't bother with potatoes just yet. <laughs> Gonna rot potatoes, in, no. in the cold soil. <laughs> um, and I mean, some of the other mistakes that you can make certainly is by not, not focusing on hygiene. It's a really important thing to consider when you're starting out seedlings is sterilize those pots and use fresh potting soil to avoid damping off. Um, down the line, you're going to set your seedlings up, you know, much healthier seedlings, uh, if you just kind of uh, obey those principles of hygiene throughout the process. Great. Okay, that's all great advice, guys. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us and, and sharing those uh, tips with us. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. That was Mark and Ben Cullen, both of whom are probably harvesting turnips already. So, here we are at the end of this episode of Harris Smith Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to this podcast at Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast player. And please, tell your friends and family. Got feedback? We'd love to hear it. You can email us at letters at harrismithmag.com. That URL, harrismithmag.com, is also where you can order subscriptions online. And you can find Harrismith Magazine on newsstands of selected stores across Canada. Until next time, for Harrismith Radio, I'm Wayne McPhail. And also, until next time, remember these four words. Make, grow, sustain, share. Tune in for the next episode of Harrismith Radio.